This is a book bowl summary of the book, exercised by Daniel E. Lieberman. All of your friends probably have the same to-do list. Exercise more. It's no wonder. Regular exercise is tooted as a cure for obesity, mental illness, lethargy, and many other conditions. There is a lot of helpful advice here, but sometimes it can be confusing. Running is good for your health, but isn't it also damaging your knees? Sleeping for eight hours is recommended, but we often wake up after seven. These papers cut through the noise by looking at human evolution from two angles. The results combine the ancient and the modern in a fresh and invigorating vision of human health. Exercise wasn't part of our evolution. When you imagine our early human ancestors, you probably envision them in motion. Whether they're hunting animals, navigating harsh landscapes, or even fighting, it's likely you imagine them as active rather than sedentary. And on a whole, that's fairly accurate. For our predecessors, physical activity was an unavoidable part of life. Whereas we could just stop at a supermarket to buy more food, early humans didn't have that option. If they wanted to eat, they had to get moving. So, what does that tell us about exercise then? That it's something evolution compels us to do? That it's entirely natural? The short answer is no. We didn't evolve to exercise. We evolved to be physically active when circumstances demanded it. Exercise is voluntary physical activity, usually undertaken in order to improve our health and fitness. And we didn't evolve to engage in unnecessary activity. Our aversion to unnecessary activity makes a lot of sense because wasting energy was dangerous when food was hard to come by. But this insight doesn't mean we should give up on exercising, just that it takes more work and dedication to overcome our instincts. In short, evolution hasn't actually given us any impulses to exercise. On the contrary, forcing ourselves to get moving involves overcoming some of our most basic instincts. So, if it seems hard to make yourself go on that jog, rest assured. That's just as nature intended. Sleeping eight hours a night isn't necessary for everyone. Experts say we need eight hours of sleep a night, but the average Westerner gets seven, and 5% of us get less than five hours of sleep each night. This is causing problems in every aspect of our lives. The idea that we need to sleep for eight hours a night has murky origins. No one's quite sure how it emerged, but we know that in the 19th century, striking factory workers like to shout, Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for what we will. As a slogan, it's memorable, but it's on the rockier ground to sleep advice. In recent years, our understanding of sleep has been revolutionized by some groundbreaking research, much of which was carried out by researchers from UCLA who found that hunter-gatherer and hunter-farmer groups in Tanzania, the Amazon rainforest, and the Kalahari Desert slept less than eight hours a night and that people who get seven hours a night tend to live longer. Contrary to popular belief, they found that these populations slept not more but less than those living in the industrialized world. On average, they got about six and a half hours of sleep each night, with a little less in summer and a little more in winter months. Research into Amish farmers, rural Haitians, and subsistence farmers in Madagascar arrived at similar results. The unavoidable conclusion, it's perfectly normal to get less than eight hours of sleep. So don't worry if your sleeping pattern doesn't exactly match the expert's recommendations. And if you do find yourself feeling sleep deprived, remember, one of the best recipes for a good night's sleep is a daytime bout of exercise. Brawn wasn't an evolutionarily evolved trait. If you're finding this video to be enjoyable, show your support by liking it and subscribing to my channel for even more fantastic content. Your encouragement means everything to me and drives me to keep creating videos for you. We didn't evolve to be naturally brawny and our hunter-gatherer ancestors probably didn't sleep for eight hours a night or go on spontaneous and unnecessary jogs. But if there's one thing we do know about our hunter-gatherer ancestors, it's that they must have been extremely strong. That's according to primal fitness enthusiasts, anyway. Proponents of this theory believe that our ancestors' everyday activities would have kept them fit, muscular, and lean. Hunting animals would have tested their stamina, for example, and moving boulders would require mammoth strength. In this view, our modern, sedentary lifestyles have turned us into weaklings. So it's up to us to regain the strength and chiseled bodies that evolution gave us. But is this accurate? Once again, there's a slight problem with this image of pre-industrial humankind. It's totally at odds with what is seen in hunter-gatherer populations today. But the Hadza, a hunter-gatherer people from Tanzania, are lean and moderately strong, but they're generally not burly. 
Hunter-gatherer peoples are fitter than most Westerners, but their strength and muscle size are nothing to marvel at. This is because it's hard to build muscle without gym equipment. From an evolutionary perspective, being beefy has its benefits, but the costs of maintaining added muscle outweigh these benefits. In short, we evolved to be strong enough to cope with everyday challenges, not to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. In terms of weight loss, walking does play an important role. Walking does have a role to play in weight loss, but it's a laborious way to shed a few pounds and makes people hungry. This is borne out by a large body of research, which shows that walkers often compensate for their activity levels by eating more. In one study, a group of overweight and unfit men and women were instructed to walk briskly for 150 minutes a week without modifying their diets. The result? Almost no weight loss, unfortunately. The reason for this is that we humans have evolved to be wonderfully efficient walkers. Walking is just one of the things we've developed to do easily and well. In most situations, that's a blessing, but it can make it hard to lose weight. Luckily, there's some hope. That same study also observed a group that walked twice as much for 300 minutes a week. Their results were more encouraging. After 12 weeks, they'd lost an average of 6 pounds. It's not huge, but sustained for a year, that could be 26 pounds off the scales. So, it seems that in order for walking to lead to weight loss, we need to do lots of it. But more important than walking's initial role in shedding pounds is the part it plays in helping us maintain a healthy weight. Within a year of crash diet, people who avoid exercise regain on average half the weight they'd lost. And after that, they slowly return to their starting weight, bit by bit. But for people who shed weight with regular exercise, it's a different story. They're far more likely to maintain the weight they worked so hard for. Walking's not a miracle pill then, but the role it can play in weight loss and weight maintenance shouldn't be overlooked. Running doesn't have to lead to injuries. Running doesn't have to lead to injuries. Many novices are put off by horror stories of veterans complaining of wear and tear to muscles and joints and all kinds of exotic injuries. Runners do sometimes pick up injuries, but the rates follow a U-shaped curve and moderate runners have relatively few issues. Running doesn't wear down your cartilage over time, and giving the body time to adapt will minimize the risk of injury. The enthusiasm with which some novices throw themselves into the sport is admirable, but it's not wise. Increasing your mileage or speed by more than 10% a week puts you at risk of injury, and there's nothing your eagerness can do to fix that. When the body does adapt, though, it can be fascinating to observe, as the author discovered back in 2015. He followed eight runners who ran 3,080 miles across the U.S. For half a year, they ran about a marathon each day, taking just one day off a week. At the start, they experienced all the pain and stiffness you'd expect. But, bit by bit, they adapted. Of the 50 injuries the runners reported, about 75% occurred in the first month. And in the final month, they reported none at all. The older we get, the more important it is to remain active. We need to stay active as we age. How do you picture your retirement? Whatever you envision, it's probably unlike the lives lived by older members of hunter-gatherer societies. Take the Hadza, the Tanzanian hunter-gatherer people we encountered earlier. While Americans walk half as much in their 70s as they do in their 40s, the Hadza's activity levels go through a much more moderate decline as they age. Hunter-gatherer societies are active into old age, and as a result, stay fit and strong much longer than people living in the industrialized world. This is why many so-called diseases of aging aren't actually inevitable as we grow older. In fact, hunter-gatherers also live quite long lives, despite the fact they're unfamiliar with modern medicine. Those who survive infancy typically live to be between 68 and 78 years old. That's not far off of the life expectancy in the U.S., which is currently somewhere between 76 and 81. The key to exercising more is to make it both fun and necessary. We need to make exercise fun and necessary if we want to exercise more. We didn't evolve to engage in voluntary physical activity, so we have to reckon with that fact. If we can't make exercise an actual necessity, we can at least try to make it more necessary. One way to do this is to create an environment that coerces us to stay fit. If you want to make exercise more fun, exercise with friends, a team, or a trainer. And if all else fails, a podcast can be incorporated into almost any workout. The bottom line is that exercise is good for us. And the better we understand our instinct to loll about, the more effectively we can overcome it. I hope this video provided valuable insight and information for you. What is your way of having fun while exercising? Weight training? 
or walking, let us know in the comments. And if you learned something new in this video, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more videos. Thank you, and until next time.